Dr. Sarah Diamond is the president of Oakhead University, Canada's University of the Imagination. She holds a PhD in computing, information technology, and engineering, a master's in digital media, and honors Bachelor of Arts in History and Communications. She's appointee of the Order of Ontario and the Royal Canadian Society of Artists and recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for Service to Canada. So I guess, so how she is excellent. So um, could you briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, um, Irena, and kind of for bringing this to Oakhead University. It's really um, um, exciting for us to have you here. And um, the whole proposition of uh, create of this create um, project is um, to bring together uh, the arts and design with um, computational capacity and to really look at how that new formulation of STEAM or STEAM plus D as some of us like to um, describe it is um, um, a really exciting new way to think about the world. So. Um, Today I'm going to talk a little bit um, about some of the work <clears throat> that we've been undertaking with um, uh, one of our um, industry partners, um, and uh, they're uh, entitled NLogic, and I'm just going to get into my slideshow here. And uh, my colleague, Steve, Dr. Steve Zaghetti, um, is here from our lab, and you'll have a chance to tour the lab later. So um, this is research that he and I have very much under have undertaken together. So. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, the idea of um, user-centered design and uh, data-driven design and explore um, how these are quite different practices and um, why in the work that we do here, where we're very interested in the process of design, we would want to test these very um, uh, interesting ways of working with data and with the design process and with different kinds of users. And I'm really glad that um, we're going to be followed by um, our colleague uh, Gord from the Globe and Mail because I think he's going to be able to illustrate some uh, ways also of working closely with users that have been very, very effective in the relationship that uh, both York and, and uh, Okidu have had with the Globe. So I'll just start out with this quote, which is um, from, uh, it's attributed to Henry Ford, and it illustrates potential problems when involving users in the design process. And um, the quote is, if we'd asked customers what they wanted, they'd ask for faster horses. And that's the end of the quote. So obviously the car um, did not come out of you know, user-centered design. It came out of a lot of visionary collaborative work with designers and engineers and then understanding this opportunity to kind of leap forward in terms of potential with innovation. So um, user-centered design certainly um, often results in very successful tool development and refinement. However, these results tend to be incremental changes, not radical innovation. And the challenge of innovation in design lies at the center of um, some of our opportunities for visualizing data. And uh, data visualization requires the adoption of appropriate visual metaphors, uh, and we're just going to illustrate user-centered design here in a minute, uh, where the choice of metaphor is coupled with both qualities of the data and an understanding of potential data use. And we use the term metaphor in the context of interface design, where qualities of a familiar object and its behavior in the real world are carried into the digital space to facilitate navigation, such as icons for files and folders on a digital desktop. And metaphors and our usage, uh, what we're talking about here, includes familiar ways of representing numerical quantities, such as graphs. And, and so we stretch that idea of metaphor to include the graph, which has a kind of familiarity that's been brought into data visualization. And data-driven approach, designers develop metaphors and interactions based on the data and its structure, very much driven by Edward Tufte's research, while a user-centered approach first considers user hypotheses and requirements. And there's lots of writing on this. And I have, um, actually, I'm going to give this um, presentation to Irena, and she can send it around to you, and you can see the um, bibliography at the end, because I put a kind of bit of a richer bibliography than one you usually would, just because um, we're addressing um, an emerging student group. So innovation and creativity are very tightly coupled, and the ability of data visualization tools to provide insight is a potential measure of creativity. And I just wanted to um, give a little bit of um, uh, subtext here about uh, conducting research with an industry partner. So NLogic uh, 
has been a partner of Oakhead University and now also working with York um, for quite a few years now. And they gave us a challenge, which was how to find novel ways that their analysis, analysts could discover insights from their data. And they were very happy to participate in this kind of ongoing experiment over a number of years. And uh, of course, when you're working with an industrial partner, there are challenges. Um, it's important to discuss issues um, you know, in an ongoing way and set the appropriate evaluation context, be able to find domain expert participants, look at confidentiality of information, and uh, also um, we do a lot of observation of complex work processes, which also often requires um, uh, confidentiality um, in what we learn about the employer and the employment processes, um, and of course how technology is going to enter or disrupt that environment. And so um, in this particular um, instance, and I'm going to describe the, the experiment in a minute, um, we were um, working with um, both design teams and uh, we had two design teams and we had to really work with an industrial partner to um, be able to segregate um, their staff because of the ways that we conducted this particular um, experiment. And I'll, I'll just get to that in a moment. Um, so with user-centered design, I know you're looking at this diagram, what's going to happen here? Um, it's been employed in the design of interfaces for decades and is increasingly prevalent within data visualization because it does allow for the dynamic management of visual metaphors and underlying data structures within the context of the culture of the user. Um, it is interesting, and I'll just make this a caveat and kind of move it to the side a bit, but with increasing work with AI and machine learning where machines are doing a lot of the analytics um, of course, you need that human interface to adopt to the culture, but it's a really exciting opportunity for visualization experts to look at how to interpret machine-driven outcomes and how you would represent that. And then once you've done that, look at how you might um, transform those representations for particular user groups. So. Um, in we, if we look at this process, um, you understand the culture, you do a lot of work within it, you under, uh, take a process of brainstorming and ideation involving the users, you undertake a whole series of sketches, and then um, you uh, build a prototype and you keep circling you know, through that process. So it's really about gathering the user's needs and constraints, analyzing their workflow and tasks identifying the design rationales and uh, representing and interacting with the data. So um, the challenges with user-centered design, and it really is something that's adopted very much um, within human-computer interaction almost as a norm now, is that it absolutely caters to the given aesthetics of a particular user. So you can say that's a strength, but it's also a weakness because you're providing something that's very familiar. And so it tends to reinforce a normative approach to the data. And secondly, user-centered design begins with assumptions regarding users' queries of the data, and arguably um, a data-driven approach, which I'll show you, show you in a minute, um, uh, lacks an initial focus on a specific user and could result in tools that are viable for a broader set of potential users and may actually reveal patterns from the data that do not conform to users' queries or assumptions. So um, again, we're just showing this um, kind of cycle of, um, of uh, design process, really, of defining the problem, diverging around it, um, synthesizing, and then realizing it. And then with the data-driven approach, and we'll just show you here where the difference is, you really begin by considering the data um, in the absence of knowledge um, regarding the specific uses in order to foreground relationships within the data that may not have been previously considered. And that approach first considers the data and its structure and then in subsequent steps looks at potential applications and the user culture. Um, and the raw data in the absence of a known user can suggest the potential of analyses based on visualizations with new aesthetics and interpretations and even entirely almost sideways kinds of applications that haven't been otherwise proposed. And uh, Benjamin Fry, who's a really uh, phenomenal uh, visualization expert and also an artist, has pointed out aesthetic structure experiences in formal and perceptual ways and really provide interpretive tools with which to construct meaning. So you have opportunities um, sometimes when you're disruptive in the kinds of visualizations that you create in helping um, analysts make new discoveries. 
So again, this is the data-driven process, understanding the data, appropriating the data, interpreting the data, processing the data, representing and interacting with it, creating a narrative from the data, um, and then a kind of usefulness testing. And um, this notion of usefulness versus usability um, is a really interesting one. Saul Greenberg and Bill Buxton, two very um, significant uh, researchers in human-computer interaction, and, and uh, in Buxton's instance, really, um, as he's the, one of the chief scientists at Microsoft. Um, they've really taken on um, this sort of separation between something that's useful and something that is usable. Um, and their notion of usefulness is, are you creating a tool um, that really helps to push discovery in a new way? Does it? Um, is it meaningful across a number of different potential groups of users versus testing usability, which is, does it work? And is the interface appropriate um, to the user group? So um, I really like that, <clears throat> that kind of separation um, because I think it, it, it operates um, um, in, a, in a kind of different place and allows us to think of visualization not only as a service tool, but something that can actually push new kinds of discovery. So um, now I'm going to show you just a little bit of um, the um, experiment that we set up. And it, it has a fairly deep history with N-Logic. And uh, again, my colleague Steve um, was very much involved with this. And uh, Dr. Fanny Chevalier, uh, who is a postdoc in our lab, and is actually, she's joined the University of Toronto, so we're excited that she's um, going to be working closely with us again, because um, she left for France for a few years. So um, what we've done um, in um, this particular research is we set up an experiment where we compared um, two different approaches to designing visualizations. So um, in, uh, in one instance, um, and so we worked with basically N-Logic's data, same data set, um, and what we were able to do is um, kind of create um, ring fencing around a group of users that worked with um, one design team and um, worked with the same data and worked very, very closely, you know, going through this, this process that I had described earlier of user-centric design. Um, and then a second group of um, users and designers, um, but supervised by the senior research team that undertook this process with the same data set. And what we were <clears throat> really interested in seeing were um, what kind of metaphors would come out of that process of um, looking at the data and we did a lot of um, actual physical sketching. It is an art and design school. We love to sketch. Um, and we really like this idea of, of, of kind of pushing metaphors. So um, what, was, what was interesting um, is, um, just to give you a little bit of a feel for the data, because it's pretty important to know what we're working with here. Um, the uh, data was compile, compiled by NLogic, and I should mention, we continue to work with them. We're off on a whole other set of issues uh, now with the relationship. Um, but the data set um, consists of detailed demographic information on, on media consumers in Canada. So in this instance, the data set we were working with were radio listeners and their consumption habits um, um, taken and discovered through market research. And both teams had access to information regarding participant recruiting and data collection protocols. So they understood how the data was collected and structured, which is incredibly important. And here at our school, we do a lot of work in uh, kind of data criticality, where we try and really encourage students to have data literacy, but also to say, you know, how is this data collected? Who made decisions on the nature of the data? Um, and then a lot of technical issues around, is it clean? What, how is it structured, et cetera? But to think about what's, what are those sources and limitations of the data? So um, I mentioned that we had these two separate teams. We worked with NLogic. Each team had three graphic designers, and each was led by um, one of our senior researchers. And uh, both of the teams worked with their design process in parallel. And um, they began with data analysis, then a design phase, followed by prototyping and evaluation. Um, and they repeated the cycle, but um, the user center's team's focus was on information provided by users, and while the data-driven design team remained isolated from the users. So very different ways of working. Um, and. Um, the um, work that came out of it was um, actually very interesting because um, we did start with sketching and then eventually we did build a series of actual working prototypes and I'm going to get to the point of showing you one which um, NLogic actually adopted. So uh, we'll see how that path moved. Um, 
but um, um, in this instance, this is um, one of the experiments with metaphor, and it's coming from the data uh, the user centered design team, and it's really uh, a tree metaphor, which is not only familiar in the field of information visualization, but the suggested interaction between the user and the prototype was identical to actions described in the needs assessment. So it changed one means of analyzing the data for another. So um, it altered the aesthetics of the interface because they'd been using a kind of graph uh, representation. Um, and it did make improvements in usability ultimately when it was built, but it failed to evoke new perspectives on the data. And it's an important point, since the incorporation of a different metaphor ideally reveals something in the data that uh, the previous metaphor did not. That said, um, representing the same data set using different kinds of graphical representations is also a very good practice, because it allows different perspectives on the data, but that's not the focus necessarily of this talk. So um, the data-driven results were quite different. And, uh, you know, in contrast um, to the user-centered design team, these prototypes emerged, um, made use of a more kind of granular data, of more granular data, and considered the nature of how the data itself was collected. The designers um, and their designs introduced metaphors intended to present data about radio stations' listener demographics to a general audience in a novel way. For example, via physical radio sets blaring in the hallways of the NLogic offices, um, which I think you're seeing here. Um, and in fact, NLogic loved this and really liked the idea um, of... Um, uh, in the appropriate context, because they do a lot of work where they present their data in, in kind of public context of using this kind of metaphor for data um, representation and analysis that allowed a kind of looking in on the data from almost a public perspective as opposed to simply that of their analysts. Um, and some of the prototypes proposed visualizations that allow technical staff at NLogic to monitor panelists. Panelists are the people who provide the input um, uh, around the data, their activity, and identify potential anomalies and outliers in the data. So you've got this sort of wall of sound idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, um, so the, the idea of the physical radio and then um, looking at auditors per geographical regions for the elevation of these, and controls would allow for the selection of different radio stations and various kinds of data filtering. And, um, and this particular design, which I'm going to come back to, um, because it, um, it was this notion of really um, being able to look at the data um, in very physical ways. So it was represented through sort of material objects. So um, some of the uh, issues in the experiment, I'm not going to go into a lot of this, were, um, you know, there was existing design bias. Um, designers did come up with typical um, user interaction visualizations and um, the usual kinds of widgets such as buttons and checkboxes to navigate the data. I mean, our students are well trained in, you know, human um, computer interaction and in very, uh, they, they know that vocabulary. So as designers, they had to be able to themselves step outside of um, you know, what was comfortable. Um, and they needed to consider and imagine um, the uh, user, they're used to doing that, and hence they brought assumptions also about the users to their work, even though um, there wasn't a user at the table within the data-driven de design approach. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, they also were able to use uh, more experimental methods such as probes and brainstorming techniques that really do exist to help designers think outside the box of their assumptions and even help users do that when they're part of a collaboration. Um, we had to synchronize the design teams but keep them separate, which I know, Steve, was phenomenal orchestration on, on your part. Yeah, and um, also um, being able to filter out information you know, from, from the users. So um, we see um, some of the results here in terms of metaphor, and um, the data-driven design team tended towards designs that did communicate statistical limitations of the NLogic data set, and the designers of the uh, and the, the designers from the user-centered design did not. So that was very interesting to our industrial partner, who expressed struggles with reminding their clients of the limits of the data itself. Um, it is gathered from a large population sample, and the increasing subdivision of the data results in sample sizes that are statistically insignificant. Um, for example, from Canadian women, 
to women in Toronto, to women between the ages of 18 and 24, of whom there are only 42 within the particular data set, to women who listened to over three hours of radio which um, per day, which it turned out in their sample set was only eight people. So you, you went from 1,200 down to eight. So um, you know, being able to show that um, to the client when they're making decisions essentially about advertising was important to to say, okay, think critically about the data, and that came out more from the data-driven design team. So um, that said, <laughs> um, what eventually emerged from the user-driven design is this notion of the stacked, stacked bar graph. Um, and um, this is the working title of a visualization that built on the strengths of a stacked bar graph <clears throat> Where a stacked bar graph allows for a visual comparison of the parts to the whole, the proposed visualization further divided the parts to allow for additional points of comparison. And a pilot study compared um, our visualization with a stacked bar graph using an, identi an identical data set. So this was the next step of taking you know, what came out of the user-centered design and then actually moving it into um, a visualization system. <clears throat> And um, the users indicated a preference for this visualization, um, although it took them some time to learn how to read the stack stack bar graph. Um, and they felt that it um, um, you know, actually did provide them with a different perspective on the data. So you can see um, how on the top, traditionally, um, the data was represented, and then how we um, were able to look at a different way of absolutely actually representing this data um, using what we call the stacked, stacked bar graph. Um, and uh, bar graphs do provide a visual presentation of categorical data, and um, subdividing each of the bars allowed for a visual comparison of the parts of a category which comprised a larger category. Um, and um, there has been certainly work um, within visualization studies, Cleveland, for example, who argued that bar graphs are more effective than stacked bar graphs because the alignment of the baseline is a key factor in judging comparisons. Um, the uh, effectiveness of bar graphs and stacked bar graphs can be argued to be very much task dependent. So um, this strategy of a stacked bar graph um, is better for part to whole comparisons and bar graphs are better for part to part comparisons. So um, in any case, the industrial partner um, <clears throat> in this instance was very much immersed in the design process um, and um, they saw the value of this kind of representation in showing the importance of age and gender demographics in relation to station listening and being able to do that quite quickly and efficiently. Um, so they felt that this was um, a really great way of um, being able to show characteristics of the data, the total audience, the audience divided by age range, and the gender per age range. So um, came out of user-centered design, uh, industrial partner liked it, is using this kind of strategy. So that's a happy story, but it isn't necessarily that um, much of a tremendous um, innovation in relationship to what they were doing originally. And um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, if you look back on this approach, um, we've then moved ahead. And in fact, today you're going to see um, a working, I learned from Steve, a working example of what came out of this whole process, which is exciting. Um, so um, coming out of um, the um, stack stacked <clears throat> bar graph, user-centered design, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll talk for a moment about um, the data-driven design. And the idea here was um, to build, a t to actually build a tangible user interface um, for radio listenership data. And it emerged directly from our initial study with NLogic. And the group developed a series of metaphors, as um, I mentioned, using physical interfaces with the data and uh, developed the sketches, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, um, this idea of a table with mechanical functions that would raise or lower, lower various columns, which was in part um, inspired by Inform, which is an interface that MIT has built. Um, 
so um, this notion um, with, uh, when shared within logic, the idea of being able to use a physical interface because it requires collaboration amongst the analysts was very exciting for them. So um, they felt that um, if they could get their analysts to not just sort of stare at a wall and talk, but actually really interact with the data in some ways, that there could be new kinds of discoveries. and. Um, um, I, I know um, I probably shouldn't give um, the end of the story away, but in fact there are. So um, we've moved into um, this way of working in a, in a very um, assertive way. It came out of this whole process a few years ago, um, and um, we built um, a series of, of, of prototypes um, and I'll just sort of describe them. I'll show you kind of where this moves. So the first set of prototypes were um, uh, didn't work. They were conceptual. They were about ways of thinking about the data. Um, but and we, um, I didn't in show you all of the images. But we use the idea of you know should the blocks be the same size? Should they be different sizes based on? the amounts of data that they represented. What could you discover by moving them around? Did people play with the data, et cetera? Um, and then um, to move forward, um, we then actually created a prototype for um, a tangible user interface for interactive data visualization. So um, the um, graspable, tangible interfaces uh, measurably increase collaboration and collaborative behavior when compared to a screen-based interface. And there, there is research in this space. And then for us, as we've been developing it, um, we've um, been able to really um, push this research forward. So I'm going to wrap up in, in a couple of minutes. Um, so we basically built a hybrid system, which is a table, a graspable tabletop <clears throat> user interface with two-dimensional screen display. The users interrogate the data by manipulating tokens on the tabletop, and the screen displays um, result in the user's query. The tokens are tracked by means of a camera placed discreetly beneath the transparent tabletop, and the bottom of each object is marked with a fiducial marker um, that um, allows um, the camera to see it, and uh, they're read using open source React TV vision software. So it outputs the position of the markers, and then they show essentially a, um, a graphical visualization. And I'm just going to take you through some of these. I do have a video. I don't have time to show it, though. Um, but I guess um, what I want to say is that what happened was um, this became an entire system. Um, it was something that uh, NLogic found interesting, useful, could provoke certain kinds of um, realizations. Um, I'm just going to go back here for a sec. Um, <clears throat> amongst its users, but um, this actually, um, as an environment, um, develops um, and kind of produces a different kind of cognitive process with multiple perspectives on the data from collaborating users. And um, we've now moved forward to develop something which is called data blocks. Um, <clears throat> and at the break, if people want to see it, I can show you the latest iteration of it. But it's a tabletop graspable user interface with which to interact with data and create visualizations. Um, it includes software. Um, and uh, um, we've actually put the system into an open source environment. People can very easily, for very, very little money, create a data analytics environment that's tangible and graspable. And we've now actually spun it out into educational applications. It's being used by teachers to help young people understand data and collaborate together. It now has um, another analytics um, representation where it allows you to um, actually um, explore huge, huge archives of data using an interface that we've built. Um, so um, just to sum up here, um, maybe what I'll do is as I am summing up is exit. Oops. Great. And these are the references. Um, and I'm going to just leave this. And OK, great. Okay, so what you're seeing now is um, <clears throat> the latest um, representation of um, how we've actually worked with the interface, which um, allows the exploration of the entire archive uh, digitalized um, 
archive of, of, of Time magazine. And it allows users to interact with that. So this is a system that started as a way of helping analysts um, interact with data and is now being used with educational material. Um, we also did an iteration of it where you can plug and play Tableau into it, which is a very common you know, software program. And you can use um, the same system to interact and develop Tableau um, visualizations using that commercial software. So um, you know, just to kind of um, end here, um, it was a really um, interesting process. We, we learned a lot. Um, and uh, data-driven design is not an approach that eliminates the need to involve users in the design process. You know, we undertook user testing and feedback um, you know, with these systems as we've created them. Um, and we've identified um, a series of new uses for um, the tangible user interface, which we now call data blocks, well beyond the original context. But um, it did reorder the steps of designing for a user group. Instead of gathering requirements and needs and then looking for means to address these needs, the designer first considers the data and the potential relationship of data points to propose tools of analysis, which are then refined based on requirements and needs by the user. There you go. Thank you. <laughs>